Right here. How's everybody? All good Democrats, I hope. Oh, this is going to be fun. Good evening. My name is uh, Bill Purcell, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. And it gives me great pleasure to again welcome each and every one of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, this year, a major theme for the forum is the future of our American political parties. Uh, our event this evening is entitled The Future of the Democratic Party 2010 and Beyond. To introduce our speaker this evening is our visiting fellows student coordinator, Tiffany Wen. Tiffany is a junior here at Harvard College, concentrating in economics with a secondary concentration in government. Public service is the number one extracurricular activity here at Harvard, so it's very appropriate that in 2007, Tiffany joined her first student organization at Harvard, Students for Hillary Clinton. As a member of this organization, she phone banked and canvassed up until the very end of Clinton's candidacy, something that our speaker and she have very much in common. Tiffany <laughs> currently lives in Winthrop House and is originally from Newark, Delaware. Please join me in welcoming Tiffany Wynn to the podium. Thank you, Mayor Purcell. Um, good evening, my name is Tiffany Wen, and I'm the student coordinator for the visiting fellows at the IOP this semester. It is my great honor tonight to introduce Mr. Terry McAuliffe. Mr. McAuliffe has spent more than 30 years in politics, ranging from uh, serving as President Jimmy Carter's national finance director when he was just 22, to serving as chairman of the Democratic National Committee earlier this decade, um, to running for office himself during this year's Virginia's uh, gubernatorial race. Uh, when he was DNC chairman, Mr. McAuliffe raised over $535 million, an unprecedented amount. Mr. McAuliffe is from Syracuse, New York, and he's a self-proclaimed hustler. Am I right? A hustler? Yep, you bet. Um, he, well, started, <laughs> he started more than 25 businesses so far, starting with his first company at age 14, uh, McAuliffe Driveway Maintenance, to help pay his way through college. Mr. McAuliffe's political acumen and charisma uh, make him one of the most influential people in the Democratic Party today. In the last 24 hours, it's become obvious to me, and uh, what will soon become obvious to all of you, that Mr. McAuliffe is the best storyteller to come through the IOP Fellows Program. It's such a joy having him here as a visiting fellow this week. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman Terry McAuliffe. Great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Give Tiffany a great round of applause, everybody. <clears throat> and to the greatest mayor in the history of Nashville, Tennessee, Bill Purcell, our director, I want to thank you. It's an honor for me to be back on this stage again. I have been here several times uh, at different points in my career. As, as most of you probably know, I have had uh, almost every job you can have in the Democratic Party. I have chaired conventions, inaugurals, uh, campaigns, uh, millennium celebrations, legal funds. Uh, <laughs> I've done it all. I've loved it. Um, I've spent a lot of time, obviously, as you know, with the Clinton family. I love them. Most expensive friends I've ever had, I will say that. Um, went through a great race in 2008 for the Democratic Party. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what's happened in the future. I want to talk a little bit about the past, but I really, when I come up here, like the opportunity to have you ask me questions because I think you learn a lot. I thank you for coming out here tonight. I cannot tell you how important the Institute of Politics. I've done several of the study groups, and I cannot tell you how important it is for all of you who want to go into politics. If anything I can do is show you as an example of someone I got in at a very young age, at the age of 22. I was going to law school, and a friend of mine, we were living in a group house, 15 guys, and said, uh, Jimmy Carter needs help in his reelection. I said, I can always go to law school. I left law school and ended up, I'd from, been from Syracuse, New York. I'd really not traveled much outside of Syracuse, New York, and ended up going to 40 states, and at the age of 23, became President Carter's uh, national finance director at a very young age. I then have stayed in, been very active with a lot of different candidates. Um, I have spent pretty much the last 18 years as a full-time volunteer in politics. I have done it all for free. I haven't taken any pay for it. I like it that way because it gives me the, f the freedom to say exactly what I want. Uh, when I was the chairman, the first chairman never to take a paycheck from the DNC. I just found it very hard to, as these lovely ladies in their 90s would send in their crumpled up Social Security dollars, I just didn't feel fair that they would pay me. I come from a business background. 
I started my first business uh, at 14. I then started 23 different companies. I have been in all different fields, but I started my first business at a young age because I wanted to go to college. I was going to have to pay for it. So I got to, got to work at a very, very young age, and I've loved it and got successful. And now I spend most of my time in politics, giving back. I think it's an important thing to do, and that's what the John F. Kennedy uh, School of Government is all about, and clearly what the Institute of Politics is all about, getting back engaged in the business of politics and helping other people. I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and I want others to have those same opportunities uh, that I had. Talk a little bit about where we as, are as a party. We're in great shape. If you're Democrats, I always like to know my audience, how many of you voted for Barack Obama? <laughs> Home field advantage here. Uh, how many of you voted for John McCain? Give these two souls a great round of applause for being out here with us today. I mean, you wish you'd voted for Barack Obama. No, I'm just teasing. Um, it was a great race we had in 2008. As most of you know, I was very active. I was Hillary's chair. I have known Hillary for about 20 years. Uh, as I always like to say, I am out there supporting candidates. I'm not against a candidate ever, but I'm always for a candidate. I, I had known her for a long time. Obviously, I had served in many capacities for President Clinton. Um, so I worked, I spent 17 months on the road, pretty much seven days a week through the 2008 campaign. When she got out, the next day, I went out for President Obama. Uh, I spent five straight months on the road for him, got out of that, then announced for governor myself, ran for governor, and uh, the voters of Virginia retired me, uh, hopefully temporarily, and so I'm now here with you. So I'm a winner being with all you folks here tonight. But I have just had a spectacular uh, life in politics. The 08 campaign of all the campaigns I had been in was probably the greatest we'd ever had. And the Democratic Party was going to make history. We were either going to elect the first woman or the first African American to the presidency of the United States of America. And that was historic. It was a great race. Uh, all of our candidates got in in early January 2007. We went all the way through 2007. And then the primaries went all the way to the end. And most of you had probably watched me on television and they'd say, well, Hillary should get out and all that. And until the voters had all made their decision, I would argue on TV, nobody's getting out, no, nor should anybody get out. It's up to the voters. And it's not up to all these pundits on television who none of them have ever run a campaign in their life telling anyone that, that they should get out of a race. We're here at the Kennedy School. I remember, too, in uh, Jimmy Carter's campaign in 1980 when uh, Senator Kennedy ran against incumbent Jimmy Carter, challenged him in the primary, we had a long primary, but it pretty much ended in March. Senator Kennedy had a message. He went all the way to the convention, held all these votes on Monday night, and nobody said he should get out of the race. And here we had a race that was very equal in number of delegates and the number of people. And I would say, why are you telling this woman who could become the first woman president of the United States of America that she ought to get out of the race, kick her to the curb? I just said, let the voters decide. And the argument as a former party chairman was, it is good for the process to have these primaries and caucuses. It was good for South Dakota and Montana in early June. They never got to play in presidential politics. They all got to have a say in who the nominee of the Democratic Party. So we, between Hillary and Barack, we had operations in all 50 states. And the day after the primaries ended in early June, the next day switched over to the general election. That put our party in probably the best shape that we have ever been in. And it was a great election. Um, I do want to give a little credit. I don't want to make it too partisan tonight. I should give credit where credit is due also. I do want to thank George Bush. Uh, he energized a lot of voters to come out and vote. He left office, as you know, with the highest disapproval rating of any president in modern history, 71%. Richard Nixon was 68. So you had a very unpopular president, a very unpopular war. I always said whoever wins the nomination was going to win the presidency of the United States. Then John McCain won the nomination. I don't want to spend too much time on Sarah Palin, but the day he picked her, I said, there's no way they're going to win the White House now. Whatever you may think, people would, the perception was, with John McCain at his age, that Sarah was probably not ready to be president of the United States of America. Forget about that she looked out her window and she saw Russia and all that kind of stuff she saw outside her window and whatever it was. Forget all that for a second. It's, this was serious times. So we had a resounding victory. We won a huge electoral college win. We picked up states, Virginia, which we had not won in 44 years. 
We won the Commonwealth of Virginia. We won in North Carolina. We won Colorado, which we'd been working on. We won New Mexico, Colorado, great. We won uh, New Mexico, which we'd won and lost several times. Came, Nevada came over to our column. It has set the Democratic Party up in pretty good shape for young people. If you can get young people to vote for you twice, you're pretty much going to have them voting Democratic. That's why that election was so important, because it energized so many people to come into the Democratic Party. And we just got to continue to move in the right direction. But it was a historic win that we had in the 2008 presidential election. Now, as we stand here today, you sit, I stand, the ground has shifted a little bit. We have some big issues that we have to deal with. We have to make a decision on the number of troops, not we, but America, but the President of the United States, how many troops, what we're going to do about Afghanistan, and most importantly, health care. My prediction is we are going to get a health care bill. I hope it's what we want. I happen to be a huge believer in the public option. Uh, I have fought on health care. I've traveled with Hillary uh, for many, many years. It was a obviously a number one topic. But we have 46 million Americans, folks, that have absolutely no health insurance. We need to make sure that those folks get covered. And that's why I hope we have the public option. But for the Democratic Party, we have to get it because I think cap and trade legislation will be pushed off to next year. I do believe that uh, the financial regulatory services legislation will get pushed off because there's not a lot of floor time left. But having health care pass is absolutely critical to President Obama and to the Democratic Party. We've got two governorships up this year. John Corzine in New Jersey today, we've had the first public poll, has him now up one point in New Jersey. So that would, New Jersey, to give him a round of applause. He was down 17 or 18 points. Virginia is a little bit more different. It's a little tighter. Most polls have Cree Deeds, who is the Democratic nominee, down seven or eight points. We can close it. We can win it. The Republican nominee, Bob McDonald, who you know uh, as the Attorney General, his thesis was disclosed that he wrote when he was 34 years old, even though they say it was decades old, that how many of you women in this audience work? Well, under Bob McDonald, that's not something you should be doing, that you are the destruction of the home life. So in his thesis, women should not work. Um, those members of the gay lesbian community, the government should do nothing for you. It is a very right-wing uh, thesis that he wrote. He said, oh, I was young, 34. Thomas Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. So we have a big race going on in Virginia. So those are the two governorships. And then next year, as we move on to 2010, big elections. We're going to lose seats in the, in the House. I mean, th that is the historical trend. Uh, I think what's happening with the public mood out there today, I, I could take Virginia today. I saw a poll the other day. We won uh, Virginia because independents were with us two to one. We're now down two to one today. I think a lot of it is because of health care. I think a lot of folks, they didn't like the TARP legislation. They didn't like the bailout for auto bailout. They didn't like the bank bailout. They don't like the idea that the government is getting into all these ideas. And I think for a lot of the um, independents out there today, they're getting very concerned. That's why I think health care is absolutely so important for us that we actually, you know, uh, make sure we pass something this year and then next year get a few other pieces of legislation done. Obviously, the energy legislation is important. Financial services is important. But... In 2010, if you go to the historical trends, we should be anywhere from 18 to 22 seats. We have a 78-seat majority in the House. We'll be in, we're not going to lose control of the House, but it, it should tighten up a little bit. In the United States Senate, historically, we have 60 seats now. We have, as you know, 58 with two independents, the two independents caucus with us, Sanders and Lieberman. You know, we should be looking somewhere probably around two or three seats. The toughest Democrat today is probably Chris Dodd in Connecticut. He probably has the toughest race. Harry Reid's numbers, the majority leader, somewhere in 50%. Um, you know, so we have a lot of different issues go on, but the Republicans have had retirements in Missouri and in Kentucky. So I think in the Senate, we're going to be all right. Will we keep the 60-seat majority? I hope so. But historical trends aren't that way, and it's important because when we get to 2012 and 2014, you take those two cycles, we have like 43 Senate seats up. They only have about 21. So what happens in 2010 will set us up for the future. Um, but as I say, if you're Democrats in the audience, we've got to make sure that we get this legislation done, and then you get on as we move into, prob into the presidential year. Ah, if I were forecasting today, I think you're going to have a very tough time 
beating President Obama. I think the Republican Party has some fundamental problems they know they have to deal with. We control the coasts. We've got all the West Coast. We have from Maine all the way down to North Carolina. We have the big Midwest states now. The Republican Party now has pockets in the South and the Rocky uh, Midwest area, which is a very hard place for them to be. But the trend lines for them are very tough. When we get 90% of the African American vote and 74 plus percent of the Hispanic vote, and we're winning a majority of the Asian Pacific Islander vote, if you look at the population trends over the next few years, by 2020, if they don't pick off some part of those constituencies, we have ourselves a very strong electoral college map going to the future. I don't know what states they could take back from us. It allows us to solidify Florida, Nevada, Colorado, California. It puts us in very good position in a lot of those states going forward. But to be honest, we have a lot of big issues that we have to deal with. And I think President Obama, let me say, has done a magnificent job. He came in and said he'd deal with stem cell. He's done that. He's dealing with the issue on Iraq. And he's done the financial stimulus is what we needed as a country. You now read the stories. We were on the verge of our financial situation going off the cliff. We were, if you believe the stories of Powelson and so forth, we were days away from the entire financial si system of the world going off a cliff. That has now been stabilized. We got to deal with the unemployment issues. But once I believe the jobs begin to come back, and it's going to take several months, once that starts to happen, we get a health care legislation. I think people will calm down. We've had, we had a tough summer. We allowed, what do we call them, the teabaggers? The teabaggers with their rallies, and which I actually enjoyed watching it. I thought it was pretty neat. You know, it's democracy in action, everybody up screaming, and, you know, I sort of like that stuff. Um, it's good. Let the process be what it is. Um, but we, we as a party, the future of our party is very strong in getting better. But as I say, anything can happen in politics. I've been doing this 30 years. Um, last 18, I've pretty much been doing it full time. I've seen ups and downs. But we now have a dynamic leader uh, as our president. And we pass some good legislation. The economy begins to come back. I think, folks, we're in very good shape for the future. So I think, as a party, you should feel pretty good shape. I don't want to depress the two people here who are representing the Republican Party, but that's OK. Uh, I've been on both sides of this equation. Uh, I was up here with Ed Gillespie a couple years ago, and Bush was in, and everybody was all jacked up and excited. If you remember back then, they were going to have a permanent majority. Remember that, what they said to the Republican Party? But it was based on fear. It was based on post-9-11. Barack Obama is building a future based on hope. And it's a different election. We all remember 2004 with John Kerry. And remember, they kept changing the color code system every day. I mean, they were, they were changing so much, they were inventing colors by the end of that presidential election. Uh, it's a different world that we live in today. And for the young people in this audience, it's really about your future. The one thing I will say finally, I'll take you to questions, which we all should be very concerned about, is the size of the deficit uh, of the United States government today. When Bill Clinton left office, he had two years of budget surpluses of $5.6 trillion 10-year surplus. Two years from today, that would be paid off. Think of that. Instead, we now have gigantic deficits, the largest we have ever seen. Primarily, this year's deficit of $1.5 trillion, two-thirds of it is the cost of Iraq, the prescription drug benefit that was not paid for in the Bush tax cuts. Now, I'm in that top 1%. Worked hard, started my businesses. You know, but under the Bush administration, I got six tax cuts. I didn't need them. I didn't want them. And why are you giving guys like me tax cuts when middle class Americans weren't getting anything? You give me a tax cut, I go buy a new municipal bond. I'm not creating jobs. But if we give middle class tax cuts, as Bill Clinton did, then you know what? People go buy washers. They go buy dryers. They may buy a car. They may buy clothes. That is what stimulates the economy. What my biggest concern is foreigners now are buying a vast majority of our daily debt that we issue. Most of it being bought by China. Our largest trading partner is now our biggest banker. That is a very precarious position for us as a nation to be in. And that's why President Obama has to work down this of deficit reduction, because of all you young people, it's going to affect your future. Can you borrow money? I've started businesses, but I was able to go to banks, and borrow money, and do all that as a very young man. A couple of times, I probably shouldn't have borrowed money, but it is what it is. You live and learn as a young person. But it's really about your future and the economic growth and what our future is going to look economically going forward. So let me now open it up for questions. Bill, I know you want to do it a certain way, but.
part of this forum is the opportunity to ask questions of our speakers. And now we will take questions from one of the four microphones here. If you'll step up to the microphone. A question in this forum has three characteristics. It is short. It asks one question. And at the end of it is a question mark. Uh, please uh, <laughs> make sure that you uh, also identify yourself and your affiliation. We'll start over here. Hi, uh, Chairman Cuff. I'm Jonathan Padilla from the great state of California. I'm a sophomore here at the college and also a member of the DNC's Youth Council. Uh, my question for you is right now, 17, uh, only 17 members of the 447 members of the DNC are under the age 35, which the DNC qualifies as young people. Now, we're talking about the future of the party, and I wholeheartedly agree with your estimate of building that majority, but what can the party do to get more young people on the DNC hmm. and to really kind of emphasize that component? Because I know there's been some controversy in the past on that topic. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I didn't know what the number was, uh, that it was 17. Uh, uh, I have my old chief of staff, Leah Daughtry, here. I'm, I'm proud to say when I was chairman, I think we had more young people than any other time in our party's history. We also appointed more women. Uh, but you want to, I couldn't agree with you more, and I don't, I don't know what the numbers are. I, I didn't do the appointments, and I'll check in. But you're right, we should be having broad representation. Young, under um, 30, under 35, that is our future as a party. And we need to make sure that we are bringing people into the party. I tried to work hard with a lot of people. I started the Youth to the Booth program. I started something new with Will I Am and the rest of them. You traveled all over the country, did. Remember Will I Am? Well, let's get it started. Uh, um. <laughs> He'd always shake his head when I would do that. Um, but you're right, we got to energize college campuses and do all that. But what can we do? We got to get you involved. And I always tried to tell state parties, because you. A lot of folks have no interest in going to state parties because they go in them, they don't feel like they're wanted. This is ours, we've had it for years. I continually tried to break that down and say we have got to bring young people in. But to be honest with you, the bottom line has got to come from funding. And uh, if you go back to the young Democrats and the college Democrats, I put records amounts of money behind those groups. At the end of the day, you've got to spend money uh, to do outreach and what we have to do. We now have the database to do it. I'm proud to say under uh, our tenure at the party, when I became chairman, as you probably know, we had no voter file. Now, the Republicans had 164 million named dope voter file. We had 18 million in debt. Uh, I told Lee and the others we need to get new tubing in the building because we've got to bring all this new internet capacity in. They came back and said the building won't hold it. The building's too old. So, okay, we've got to build a new headquarters. One thing led to another. It was like a string unraveling on a sweater. But one of the biggest things we did was to build a 175 million plus named data file so that I knew every young person in the country, I knew everybody pretty much. I knew if you owned a dog or a cat, if you liked beer or what you liked to hunt, whatever, so that we could communicate. And you know, that's why I'm proud to say that under our tenure, we raised 565 million, a record that still holds today by over $140 million. And we did it mostly with new young people. So you and I should talk some more. Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. If I were chairman, I'd appoint all young people in the future. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I've done my deal. <laughs> Hi, my name is Christian Garland. I'm a senior at the college. Hey. Yes, sir. Um, my question deals with the campaign. I worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign in New Hampshire, um, and I worked with Tiffany when, we, when I came back to organize on the campus afterward. And one of the things that frustrated us the most um, was Indiana. And so I was wondering oh. if you could speak to, um, to what your experience was dealing with that holdout. Um, when the mayor wouldn't release the vote totals, that clearly gave her a win. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, that was a real turning point in the campaign. We had North Carolina and Indiana on a night. The press and everybody said that was the big night. It was the big thing. And, and I, I remember it vividly because I was out in Indiana. I was out with Hillary and the president. We were all out there. And I remember I was up doing all the television deals. And they said, well, get down. We may not win. After they said early on we were going to win, then they put me back up. I was up and down. And what happened was when North Carolina closed, within three minutes they announced the results. So for on national television of these two critical states, you had North Carolina sitting there. Now Indiana, early, like 7.30, they said Hillary's gonna win Indiana, we got enough exit data. But they never would call it, and one of the mayors of a city, I'll let you mention it, which you already did, uh, withhold, withheld the votes for five hours so that they couldn't announce Indiana. So we just sat there, 
And I remember I was up on stage, up on the, the podium doing the, the TV shows, and I got a call, you better get downstairs, Hillary wants to see you. So I went down to the basement into the, the hold room, and I remember like it was yesterday, there was a couch, and it was Hillary and the president, and a couple other people, Evan Bayh, the state chair, and we said, well, what's the deal with the, you know, it's now like 11 o'clock. What, I mean, this is getting ridiculous. And finally, I said to Hillary, I'll clean up my language because we have so many people here, but basically I said, forget it. They've already said we want it early in the night. Let's get up there and declare victory, and let's get the heck out of here. And I went through the point, and, you know, um, that Senator Biden likes to tell the story. He said, well, what if we don't win? It could cause us problems. I looked at Hillary and said, if we don't win in Indiana, it's over anyways. And the president said, Terry's right, let's go. So we all go marching up the steps. Several people in the back are yelling, we shouldn't really do this. And I'm yelling, Hillary, go, let's go. <laughs> and you know, I've got a loud, booming voice, so he couldn't hear anyone else but me. But there was a lot of tension, as you can imagine. This was a big night. And I'll never forget it. So they got to go out, and there's just a huge crowd outside. And there's a little area in the back where we're standing that's you know, surrounded by blue drapes, ready for them to announce. And just stand there is the president, Hillary, and Chelsea, and myself. But I could tell that the president's really, President Clinton is really not in a good mood. You know, you could tell when the president wasn't in a good mood. <laughs> Hillary wasn't the best in the mood. I said, my goodness, I don't want them walking out on camera, you know, because people pick up all kinds of things. Now, earlier in the night, Andrea Mitchell had been interviewing me. And when I finished the interview, I don't know if you've ever been up at these primaries, they got you all wedged in these little risers, 100 cameras, and you got to jump over everything. So I finished with Andrea, and I went down, and a tr one of the metal tripods caught my pants right here, and literally ripped it all the way down, wide open. So I had my assistant there, I said, I need a stapler, you poor Yael. So I said, I need a stapler. So we're stapling the whole day, we get my pants put back together, and it's all staples, but it is when I went back into TV. So I figured, what do I do, do, do? I said, Hillary, did you hear what happened to me tonight? And uh, no, what happened? This is just about to go on. I said, look it. And I ripped off the staples. You could see my boxers hanging. And she just broke out laughing. Clint broke out laughing. I said to the advance guy, open the gate. <laughs> and off they went laughing as they went up on stage. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. But he held those votes for four or five hours delivered. This is what it is, though. Listen, I've been doing this a long time. But it was a great night. We ended up winning Indiana. But by that time, the papers had all gone to bed. So the next morning, all they could talk about was North Carolina. Good question. Yes. I'm, yes. Um, I'm, con yes. Um, I'm concerned that, um, I'm, um, I'm concerned that, um, I'm concerned that the Republicans might win control of Congress next year in 2010. Do you think they will? I hope, um, I sure hope not. I sure hope not. And, 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 and the other thing is, why, <laughs> And the other, th and the other question, my other question is, why has it always, why has it always been a historic trend that, that the opposition party, that the opposition party to the president, to the president of the White House, whether it's the Democrats or Republicans, or what, what, why is it that, that the opposition party um, has always won control of Congress? For example, the Republicans winning control of Congress, whether it's the Democrat president in the White House or, or, yeah. or vice versa. Yeah. Okay. Good questions. Uh, first, I'd say, I don't, th listen, something catastrophic, ha if we didn't get health care passed and didn't get this other legislation, I think people would say, well, we got to get the Republicans. It's not that they're offering anything. They're on the outside just attacking, but, you know, that's what they do in the opposition. They did it for very effectively under the Clinton term, under President Clinton's term. There are 49 seats, Democratic members of Congress, in districts that John McCain carried. So those obviously are... If we shift 40, we lose control. So those 49, obviously, are their top target. There's probably, adding the 49 total, about 100 seats in play. Shouldn't, dynamics shouldn't be there. I do worry as we go on from there, but, you know, it shouldn't really have, uh, we had a historic change in 1994. President Clinton, you know, the gay and the military issue, the crime bill, if you remember the crime bill, which I supported. I mean, the idea that, Certain people should not be able to go in and buy firearms if you've been, had mental illness, convicted of a felony, assaulting spousal abuse. You know, that was you know, pretty reasonable legislation, but it really hurt a lot of our members. And at this time in 1993, 
we had already had, I think it was 26 retirements. The, the thing for you to watch over the next three months are these filing deadlines and how many Democrats decide to retire. Now, I think we have eight today, but they're not retiring for the sake of retiring, they're running for other jobs. That's good news for us. So if we can continue that trend, we won't have a 1994, but if enough members say, gosh, I went to the summer to all these, these uh, town hall meetings and they were throwing stuff at me, yelling it isn't worth 178 grand a year, or whatever, all this abuse, I'm leaving, but you haven't seen that today. So the key to watch is the next couple months, filing deadlines are beginning to come up and members of Congress have to file if they're gonna run for re-election. That's the thing to watch. Today we're in very good shape. <laughs> what it is is why is it? America, be honest with you, likes checks and balances. Right. They like it. They like one party to have this and they like a check on the other side. This gigantic thing hanging out there today is this deficit. And they're worried about government getting in these areas that, in, you know, that maybe the government shouldn't be in. And that's what they're thinking about. But the bottom line, <laughs> it's the economy. Once the economy begins to turn and move upward, a lot of these concerns go away. But until you have monthly reports <laughs> where we are creating jobs, not losing them, it's going to be a tough political climate. Once that changes, overnight, we pass health care overnight, you know, we're going to be in very good shape going into 2010. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, Chairman McAuliffe. Um, as you, my name is Scott Darnell, second student, second year student at the Kennedy School. From? Uh, from New Mexico. Right. Um, as you noted, a, a substantial portion of Mr. Deed's campaign in Virginia uh, has attacked uh, Mr. McDonnell on the, the contents of his thesis yeah. that he wrote 21 years ago. Yes, sir. Um, when he was age 34. Yep. Uh, my question is this. Um, as an audience full of people who are daily have to address difficult policy problems that we face, who are encouraged and who enjoy thinking about policy options and alternatives and writing about those and putting them in print, uh, outlandish, sometimes mainstream, thinking about wide, or wide ranging problems. Um, as an audience who, who does that daily, do you feel it's appropriate for Mr. Deed's campaign or other campaigns to focus so heavily on something that uh, a candidate writes many decades ago, many of the students here yeah. at the Kennedy School are 34 years old, are, yeah. are, are in that same age range. And yeah. what is the message to us as yeah. students when we see that play out and happen in, yeah. in high profile campaigns? No, very good question. Uh, should it be the basis of your campaign? No. Now, the Washington Post has done their fair, <laughs> Cree pretty much doesn't have to say anything because the Post is every day doing it. Listen, I ran for governor in Virginia. Are you from Virginia? Do you spend time there no. campaigning? Okay. I don't know if you went from New Mexico over there. I spent my whole campaign, I said a couple things when I started. One, I will not attack my opponent. I never had a negative ad. I never issued anything negative. I ran a campaign on policy initiatives. I put out a 165 page business plan, very specific detail of what as governor I wanted to do. That's how I thought it was important to run races. And I got, man, I got attacked. That's okay. Everyone perceived me as the front runner. Yeah, I'm a big boy, I get it. Uh, but no, I think you gotta give, people are gonna vote for something, not against. And I think the problem that they have in New Jersey is the Republican candidate there, all negative, no one knows what he stands for except he went to Bruce Springsteen concerts. You're right, you gotta offer a plan for it. And my advice, I don't like to talk about my personal conversations with candidates, but it would not be far from what you're saying, tell people what you stand for. People don't vote the negative stuff. Now, it's out there, so people know it, forget it. What are you going to do to fix transportation? Virginia is the ninth wealth, wealthiest state in America. We are 37th on teacher pay. I can go all, we're one of the few states next year that no longer will be able to apply for federal highway matching funds because we don't have the state grant. We are broke. That's what we should be talking about. I agree with you 100%. And all I can tell you is not talk. If you go back and look at my campaign, what you are saying is exactly the type of campaign. I think people want to be with positive, upbeat ideas. I just needed to convince <laughs> some more of that. But Virginia's a little tough because it's an open primary, as you know. And on my primary day, I mean, the polls had me up 10 points or whatever. But in Virginia, there were no Republicans on the ballot. A large number of Republicans came out and voted on the Democratic primary day. It's an open primary. Anybody can vote. I think I got them a little bit excited, but that's okay. I still enjoy it. But great question. Thank you. Yes. I thought oh, I'm sorry. How you, I'm, I forgot we have two up there. I apologize. I'm sorry, Bill. You're the director. You pick who you want. 
Um, Chairman McAuliffe, my name is Toby. Uh, I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is about, you had mentioned that Senator Clinton had a right to stay in the uh, primary until the very end so the voters you know, could have their say, and I completely agree with you. My sure. question is, how do you reconcile that with 2004 when the Democrats um, worked to push Ralph Nader off the ballot in, in battle states, and didn't voters in those states you know, have a right to express their opinion for Ralph Nader? Yeah. And, you know, I know, you know, Ralph filed a federal lawsuit on that. He named me in the suit. It's been thrown out. The party had nothing to do. There were organizations, rightfully so, that kept him off the ballot. It wasn't the party. I went and sat with Ralph Nader twice and said, Ralph, listen, 2,000, you know the numbers in New Hampshire, you know the numbers in Florida. If those votes had gone to Gore, Gore would have been president. He doesn't believe that thesis law, which is fine. He's entitled to it. But he complained after 2,000 that no one from the party reached out to him. So I said, I'm going to reach out to him. And I said, Ralph, listen, you got a lot of important things to say. Now, if you go into what our, our basket of target states, every vote you take, you're not going to take it from John McCain. In, in 04, you weren't going to take it from George, clearly weren't going to take it from George Bush. You got a lot of messages. Be part of my surrogate program, go around to all those other states. I tried to bring him into it. He, he just didn't want to do it. Listen, I don't think, I, I'm for everybody getting in. If you go look at my public statements, I thought that we had eight, nine, 10 candidates in 04 running. It was great. Let the voters decide. Um, but the party didn't keep Ralph off. I went to him on my own to say, I want you in the party working with me. But he, you know, he chose not to, and that's his right. He didn't have to do that. So yeah, I, I don't agree. Let everybody run. My point on Hillary is until someone got, and I kept saying this, y'all watch me on television, until someone gets that magic number, it's not over. It's not up to you, Chris Matthews or Keith Oberman or any of the rest. It's not up to you. It's up to voters. And I got to tell you, at the end, and Barack Obama, and I've known Barack for 12 years. He ran when I was chairman of the party. I went up and went door to door to him when he ran for the Senate. The day Hillary got out, he called me. I said, Barack, let's go. And I spent five months on the road for him. He would agree that the primary process in 08 was good ultimately at the end. He had a lot of folks on television talking about stuff. They'd never run a campaign in their lives. They didn't know what they were talking about. It energized everybody. And I kept saying at the end, if Hillary doesn't get it, we want those 18 million women fired up for the general election. And ultimately, everybody came together. Contrary to all the yuck, 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 they came together. I'm being nice tonight, folks. Thank you. Great question. Oh, director. Hi. Uh, my name is Peter Witzler. I'm a mid-career student here, uh, which means I graduated uh, May 27th, 1145. So if you're looking for young Democrats, Great. Um, lots Great. of folks that day. Um, but my question is about the, is about the primaries. Um, one of the things that is credited for uh, Obama's victory was the openness of the campaign and sort of the circular um, making the messenger, uh, the message, the message is the messenger, that whole sort of thing about it. And uh, I guess one of the criticisms of the of your campaign with Hillary was that, uh, you know, is this very hierarchical, triangle, top-down uh, kind of thing. So I wonder if you can just speak a little bit about those comparisons and maybe just maybe a broader question of, you know, what are some of the lessons you learned on that campaign that you then were able to apply to the general election and then also your recent governors? Yeah. Now, at the end of the day, people can, you know, I'm not a Monday morning quarterback, never have been. Uh, Hillary ran a great campaign. I knew when this race started that there were going to be a lot of challenges. I think to the, uh, the progressive, the liberal part of our party, the issue of dealing with the war vote was always problematic. I mean, there were issues out there. Uh, you know, my personal opinion, I think the campaign should have more about having the first woman president of the United States of America and all the, I mean, that truly has changed. We've never had a woman president of the United States of America. But listen, it was a close race and it came down to the end. I always knew that the press or whatever, there was always going to be the anti-Hillary. I mean, it was Hillary the front runner. There was going to be somebody who came up. And President Obama did a great job. Early on, there was talk that maybe Edwards could do it. Ended up being uh, President Obama, who got a lot of that early initial support. But, you know, Hillary ran a great campaign. I mean, they both got, as you know, about the same number of votes. It came down to these superdelegates uh, picking it. Um, but, you know, I, it's not me to criticize. I ran my own campaign. I have no complaints against mine. I mean, I was happy. I got in. Two people had been in for a year. We'd been in the state senate, state legislature. I got over 80,000. I I, that's not my nature. And she ran a great campaign. She worked her heart out. 
She would have been a spectacular president. She didn't make it. The next day she went for Barack, and, 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 and President Obama will tell you, she did every single thing he asked her to do. And she's now a magnificent Secretary of State. I saw CNN, she has a 76% approval, highest she's ever had. You know, you, <laughs> you get in these things, you do your best, and uh, every campaign, I've done a lot of them, every campaign is unique, different. Obviously, the Iowa caucus, when uh, President Obama won that, I think that was a defining change. I think uh, uh, Hillary had a majority of the African-American vote, but then when President Obama won, I was, well, maybe there's a shot that he could win this. So obviously, Iowa was probably the biggest determinant. And then, you know, we went on and, you know, I tell the story. In Iowa, you know, I was out there, and then the night before, we had a huge rally. And we were backstage after, and it was uh, Hillary and... Bill Clinton and a couple of us standing there. and We had all the staff there, and we said, well, how are we going to do? And we were going to win 36.3 to 35.2 to 31.9, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, I felt pretty good. What did I know? So the next night is the caucus, and at 8 o'clock or whatever it ended, and I remember I walked into the boil, and we were staying at the Fort Des Moines Hotel, and I walked into the boil room where all these computers are set up, and they're getting the results. I thought we were going to win. I'd been told by everybody we were going to win. And I walked in. I knew the second we walked, there's trouble here. And um, Howard Wolfson was at one of the computers. He gets up to get a piece of pizza. He comes walking by me. He said, Howard, how are we doing? You know, I'm the ultimate optimist, of course. Uh, we're going to get our you-know-what kicked. I said, what? He said, yeah, we might come in third. I said, third? How are we going to win? Right then my beeper goes off, and it says President Clinton's looking for you. So I go up to the top floor, knock on the door, Secret Service let me in. The president's there on the couch all by himself. I remember, like yesterday, he was watching a Tennessee football game. He says, Mac, you want a beer? I said, yeah. I got a couple. <laughs> he said, why? What's going on? I said, you haven't heard anything? He said, no, what? <laughs> I said, we're coming in third. He, third! <laughs> Hillary! He yells. She's in the next room. She comes out. Mac, tell Hillary what happened. I said, we're going to come in third. And, Whew. So that was, you know, you always had these moments in a campaign that you remember. But, you know, God bless her. We got up. We pulled the staff. She, she, she got a chair. She held my shoulder, said, we're going on. We went to New Hampshire, and she put on the fight of her life, and we went on. Great for the Democratic Party. We had a woman and an African man. It was history, and it was the greatest six months. I mean, our party had never seen anything like this before. Now, I know if you're in different campaigns, it wasn't as exciting as I'm making it for you, but it, it was something. It was exciting. But, you know, I'm proud of her, you know. And listen, we are friends. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, Terry, you fought with her right to the end. You're always on top. What are you, nuts? You know, I'm big on loyalty. I'm sorry. I'm Irish Catholic, man. I mean, I'm big on loyalty. I stick with my friends. Everybody's with you when you're winning. Who's with you when you're not winning? I was going to fight to my last breath until Hillary Clinton said, Terry, stand down. And until she did it, you, she was my buddy, and I was fighting like a dog. But I did it all fairly. I never once said a negative word about any other Democrat in the race. It's not my nature, former chairman of the party. I'm for things, not against things. Now, I did have a few things to say about John McCain, but that was a different party. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jared Lodeholt. I'm a native South Carolinian in a second year uh, at the Kennedy School. Where in South Carolina? Orangeburg, South right. Carolina. Been there many times. Absolutely. Some great barbecue. There is. There yeah. is. Um, I guess the question I had was, what advice would you have for uh, party, state party leadership and party activists in states like Georgia, South Carolina, and Alabama about, around building the Democratic brand in sometimes very hostile uh, statewide yeah. environments? Yeah, and, and I would encourage as many of you can to get active in the state party because it's important for you to rebuild them, help them raise money. Uh, get young people in. I, I, I do this all the time, encourage young people to run for the uh, state offices, right. uh, for the party, and to start running for office as a young person. I think it's important that you do that. I always try to make the argument, especially in a lot of the southern states, you have a lot of folks down there who will vote against the Democrats. They're voting against their own economic interests. Right. I like to remind everybody that Bill Clinton created 22 million new jobs, Reformed Welfare, Family Medical Leave Act, peace around Michael through the whole deal, and budget surpluses, the lowest federal workforce since John F. Kennedy was president. I try to remind people that, that it's about job creation. President Bush did not help folks on their economic. In fact, 
He's the one that put us in this debt situation with China today, which I, you know, a very dangerous situation. At the end of the day, I think people, what they're most concerned about, can they put food on the table, can they give their children a quality education, and do they have health care? All the issues that our party for years have prom promoted. And I think the more you keep talking about it, but, you know, some people you're not going to change. I, try, I told a group today that I was speaking to, you know, don't get in an argument. Some people just, you know, and, you know, people recognize me from TV. They shout all kinds of things at me in the airport and stuff. That's all right. I just don't engage in getting in political arguments. You're not going to change their mind. They're not going to change. Be happy and go on and just make positive arguments. And uh, I always say bring it back to the economic arguments. We as Democrats will always win. If, if you remember, uh, Ronald Reagan, gigantic deficit built up. George Bush won. Clinton had to pay that off. Now President Obama's going to have to come in and pay the lad off. It's the Democrats who bring fiscal responsibility. President Bush increased domestic spending 8%. I'm not about the war and all that. He added thousands of regulations to the federal registers, uh, which cost businesses lots of money. If you actually go through and look at who's been good for business and job creation, it's our party. But we need more people standing up and raising heck. Don't be timid. Get out there and fight it. Have a good time doing it. Um, how many of you have read my book? How was it? Greatest book you ever read? Looks as good as the Bible. What? I talk about all these things we need to do as a party. And, you know, I've already been paid for my book, so I'm not trying to hawk my book. But uh, I just think it's important that we get out there. Now, as I say, I'm passionate, obviously. I've spent half of my life doing it as a volunteer out there because I just believe so much that we can change people's lives, young people. I'm telling you, young people, look, I got in at 22 years old. I, I knew nothing when I got in it. I went to 40 states, ended up being Jimmy Carter's top fundraiser. I was 22. I didn't know anything, but I could sell. You go out and ask for money or ask for a vote, what's the worst thing they can say to you? No. No! I wouldn't have had a date in high school if I took no for an answer. <laughs> I love no. <laughs> no means yes. You just start the negotiations. That's all you got to right. do. I love right. it. Some guy said, give me money. He gives me money right away. I give it back. Let's have a little action over this thing. Then I want more out of you. You know what the? I'm a little nutty that way. But I did once wrestle an alligator for $15,000, so I'm a little different than some. I've heard some pretty creative and vituperative spins on no asking people for their votes before. But thanks for your <laughs> voter file. Um, it was great help campaigning in the field. Um, my question would be more tactical. Yep. In the last presidential election, we saw a pretty major shift in the way that fundraising was done. We saw a lot more grassroots um, people donating very small amounts. How, from that one election, do you see it impacting the future? Do you think that's sustainable? What's the role of big donors now? What do you think that's going to look like in coming elections? Yeah, and just remember, for presidential, you can give $2,400. Not that that's not a big check, but People always confuse the idea. The days of those big, big checks are gone. That went with McCain-Feingold. No, uh, but even, even then you can have bundling practices and oh, other ways in which you allow, sure. large, yeah. you allow small people to have large incomes yeah. as opposed to half of your fundraising yeah. coming from donations. Let me be honest. You want it all. Yeah. I want big folks raising lots of money, bundling it together. I want small. You want it all. But you got to have a strategy. Oh, yeah, we always have a strategy. I mean, listen, I'm proud to say that you know, I serve, I was chairman when they passed McCain-Feingold. Everybody said this party was tipped over. It all raised big money. It's over. You know, we outraised the Republican National Committee for the first time in history under my tenure, 2004. And we did it with the small donors from the data file that we built. And everybody said, oh, they're dead. Now, the great thing about it was, though, pretty jacked up, when, you know, I get excited about all these things. Um, as Leah remember, when I, my first day in, I asked every staff member at the DNC, give me one suggestion. If you were chairman, what would you do? We got crazy. We got stuff. We didn't have, um, what do you call it, caller ID. So we were able to fix hundreds and hundreds of things. But then the building and this and that. So we went out and uh, did a massive capital campaign. I don't know, 30, 35 million. I went out and got one guy to commit to 10 million. I got another to give five million. The greatest thing is, we built this gigantic hard money small donor machine with large soft checks in 2001. Yeah. Excitement it drove the Republicans crazy. They tried to do an amendment at the McCain Feingold at 2 in the morning. They actually called it the McAuliffe Amendment. We had all this money raised for the new headquarters to build television, radio, the data file, ready to go. They put an amendment in that said if the money isn't spent, 
by the 31st, you can't spend it. Now, I can't build a new building in four months, three months. So we actually, and God bless the Democrats, you got to love them. They rolled over until Lee and others called me. I remember I was down at National Theater, pulled me out of a play. I was there with my wife. I get to see my wife once a month. Told me this. I said, are you out of your mind? And I got on. I drove up to Capitol Hill. I explained to these folks the DCCC. I was building them a new headquarters for free. So we got it fixed. But, <laughs> but my point, folks, is had we not done that, what would have happened on January 1st, 2003? The $18 million in debt would have become a hard money debt. Our mortgage on the old building would have become a federal money debt. We wouldn't have had hard money to build a data file. So luckily, in two years, we were able to fix it with the help of a lot of great people. So it was fun. And I stood on a stage with President Obama recently. He said if Terry and his team had not built that data file, it wouldn't be president. It was great. Now, we can all take credit, but we, I just love the idea that, you know, we got it under the deadline, and it was fun. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I love going to ask people big 10 million checks. I mean, golly, I mean, that really gets you fired up. Well, and as a conclusion, I thanks. can't do it anymore, but yeah. Thanks for the data file. Okay, you bet, you bet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. McAuliffe. My yeah. name is Stephanie Lewis. I'm a junior at the college. And regarding energy policy, do you think that if when we get around to doing it after healthcare in the, in the future, um, we should do an approach, or the Democratic Party should do an approach with a regional basis, because the Southeast and the Midwest, you know, really are heavily dependent on biofuels yeah. as an industry, whereas the Mountain West might be more inclined for solar or wind. Yeah. So how would you approach that as a DNC chairman might? Great question. And I can just tell my personal experience running for governor, I predicated my whole campaign. On, we got your, your, your next governor has to create jobs. How do you create jobs? You got to do them in the green area. Though that's the future. It's the internet of the future. Green jobs. Um, you know, one of the first things I did in, in, in Virginia, Dominion Power, if any of you live in Virginia, is very powerful. It's very powerful. Right off the bat, I said, I will not take their check. No candidate ever in Virginia history has ever told Dominion. One personal, but folks, I needed a renewable energy standard. They won't let you have one in Virginia. Well, how can I bring business in? If you're going to invest money in green energy, you're going to go to one of those 27 states that has a renewable energy standard. You're not going to go to a state that doesn't have it. It's really, it, it really impacts a state in their future for job growth. Now, every state's different. Virginia's a big coal, and I wanted us to move to wind. I talked about building wind off the coast. And I agree with it. We should be doing it regionally and let each region who has different resources. I met with a team the other day who are doing these gigantic solar fields out in Arizona and New Mexico. Spectacular. They can light up cities with what they're building right now today. Now, it's very expensive. Wind you can do. There are certain states that have a lot of wind. I'm not talking about human beings. I'm just talking about what you get from the atmosphere. And there are some are good wind states and some aren't. So you're right. We ought to be using the capabilities we have. But the green is our future. For all you young folks here, that's what you ought to be getting into. I mean, my latest adventure is I'm trying to build a green car, uh, green tech automotive. You can go on my website. I've built four prototypes. You get 65 miles to the gallon. I can sell them for $20,000. The Tesla is nice, but it costs you 100 grand. Let's build green where everybody can buy them. And uh, actually, we're breaking ground today, uh, which I was supposed to be at, but I'd much rather be with you folks here. I was supposed to be in Mississippi today. But this is the future. But you're exactly right. We should be looking more as a regional because we have assets in these different regions, Florida's sun and where those have wind, some have sun, wave technology, algae to energy. We've got the camera going, so I can't really say what, every, what everybody called me in Virginia, but I was infamous for going around with a chicken. They called me Governor Chicken something because I talked about chicken waste every day. Why? We have 48,000 poultry farms in Virginia. Right now, all of that waste leaches into the Chesapeake. The Chesapeake is dying. We could convert every ounce of that chicken waste into energy. Technology exists. We need to start doing it and quit talking about it. Thank you. Ah, fired up on that, too. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, Gabe Neustadt from Tampa, Florida. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, you, know, you, you mentioned that uh, you said that uh, George Bush was the uh, you know, greatest gift to the Democratic Party. So my question is, how do you take that and turn that into a long-term strategy uh, for growth in the party? And two, are you concerned with the party's recent poll uh, numbers sliding, with the president's recent poll numbers sliding, yeah. that what you thought was newfound allegiance uh, to the Democratic Party was actually just animosity towards the last uh, administration? Yeah, good question. I think it was a little bit of both. 
But Bush is gone. I mean, it, you know, so it's, it's a long-term political strategy. He's back in Houston doing whatever he's doing. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. But he's, he's up. President Obama, no, now it's his. Iraq, Afghanistan, the budget. Where are you all going? <laughs> it's, it's President Obama. So it's now up to President Obama. And let's be, let's be clear for all of us that are Democrats in this audience. We have 60 seats in the Senate. We got a 78% 78 vote lead in the United States House of Representatives. And we won the presidential election with a gigantic electoral college victory. If we can't pass this stuff now, we're never going to pass it. That's why if you're going to do health care, do it right now. We're never coming back to it. And I'm just passionate over this health care deal, folks, because my campaign, everyone I've been on, every day, 10, 15 parents come up to me and give me their horror story. Now, I have five children. I spend $20,000 a year on, on health care premiums. Okay, I have to make $35,000 because it's after-tax dollars to pay my health premiums. You know, I can afford it. How many Americans can have $35,000 without spending another penny on anything else just to do? Not many. Now, I don't ever go to bed ever worried about my five children that if they get a catastrophic illness, leukemia or whatever, that they're not going to get the best care. Every parent in this country should go to bed knowing that their children, if they have a catastrophic illness, can be covered. We're the greatest nation in the world. We spend a sixth of our budget on health care. Why are we allowing pharmaceutical companies to have lifetime patents? You go to Europe, you get 10 years. You have a patent, you get a lifetime patent, guess what? You can charge whatever you want all the way out. When I campaigned up in Detroit, Michigan, in the presidential campaign, buses at every one of these big shopping malls, buses of senior citizens getting on buses and driving to Canada, buying their drugs, and coming back home. Identical drugs you can get here in America, but they can get them for 20 cents on the dollar. That's wrong. Of these 46 million people, where do you think they get their health care? If they get sick, where do they go? Emergency room. Who do you think pays for that? You do. Get everybody in the system. At a minimum, everybody should have catastrophic. Every parent should be able to buy, at a reasonable fee, catastrophic insurance for their children. We're the greatest country in the world. So this is our shot, and I give uh, uh, President Obama tremendous credit and a lot of people said, oh, hold off, don't do it, let's wait. You wait, we aren't going to get it. He is doing what he said he would do, and we got to make sure we get the rest of the folks down there. And I do think a couple senators, maybe Olympia Snow, or I do think some of them will come around and say, yeah, we got to do this. This is our shot to do it. We got to get health care. We got to deal with climate change, some big financial regulation. We got to deal with these issues. And in fairness, President Obama, he's pushing every one of them. And he needs our help. I thought we were going all night. Okay, all right, I'm just teasing. Hi, Mr. McAuliffe, yeah. thank you for coming. I'm Zach Sherwood, I'm from the great state of Indiana, so I'm just talking about then, and I wanna offer a warm Hoosier apology for the uh, it's okay. little debacle this spring. It was a spring, fun story. Indiana, we don't get yeah. very much news attention. You owe me a so pair we, of pants. Uh, <laughs> we, try to, we try to live in the limelight as often as possible, <laughs> but um, one of the things you've been discussing about, or at least I remember from your study group yesterday as well, is the fact that you think it's very beneficial for the Democratic Party to have competition in terms of new members running for office, yeah. and young people running for office, and turnaround in the Democratic yeah. Party. But also I noticed, especially coming from a state that voted Democrat for the first time since 1964 that doesn't share nearly the same political sympathies as Democratic strongholds around the rest of the country, moderates and what the so-called blue dog Democrats are very popular right. in those areas. But when, on issues such as health care and those things in terms where instead of now it being a Democratic Republican debate, it's also including a, Democrat, a liberal Democrat versus a moderate Democrat debate. Do you find that beneficial for the party and or do you <laughs> think it would be more important for the party itself to unite behind a common cause rather than having such division? Well, good question. We are a huge party. I like to say you haven't lived until you've been DNC chairman to preside over a DNC meeting. But you know, that's the genius of our party. It's what makes it exciting. But the key for me though, on big, huge, important issues like healthcare, we as a party at the end have to all come together and we can find a way. And I love good healthy debate and so forth. What we were talking about earlier is, you know, listen, one of the problems I think we have today is 99% of members of Congress win re-election. I think that's horrible. 
Uh, when I was gov running for governor, I said I would appoint a nonpartisan commission to look at redistricting in Virginia. Competition is good because it makes, keeps people on edge, thinking, working hard. If you know that 99% are gonna get reelected, I'm sorry, I wouldn't do that in business. And you know, listen, people, term limits or whatever you wanna do, people go in and serve, you ought to do your duty with good creative ideas and then let other young new ideas come in and blossom as well. But this idea that these members continue in year after year after, without competition, I think it's the worst thing for democracy. And you wonder why we have broken down the process the partisan games that go on today. It's one, because they don't have competition, they can do it. I think TV has created such a point counterpoint all day long, bop, 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 back and forth. I think it's horrible for democracy. When I first got in this business, you know, I did a lot of work with uh, Tip O'Neill. He and Bob Michael, at the end of the day, they would just get in a boxing match every day. At the end, they'd go out and have a beer together. That's great. I mean, you and I can have policy difference, or where's Caleb? I know. Uh, where did Caleb go? Where's my head of the young Republicans who always is asking me questions? Um, I, we can have policy differences. That's okay. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. This is what America's all about. So I think more competition. I think it's good to have young people in, running, get out there active. And uh, I think the party has to aggressively go out and support young people to get them in the process to keep engaged. Boy, pressure. Last question here. This is. Hi, Mr. McAuliffe. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, my name is Chris Holliday, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, it seems that Republicans in Congress uh, now feel that uh, they seem they seem to feel that uh, they seem to feel that uh, the need to um, try to uh, excuse me. All right, it seems that the Republicans in Congress uh, feel that they need to uh, try to try to uh, have the Democrats own their complete their own complete election, or their own, uh, excuse me, their own legislation and, the, and have the negatives that follow through it. And so my question was, should the Democrats really feel that they should follow this Republican stance in trying to push through their own legislation, or should they try to have a more centrist view in which they would not alienate the political center or even the right? Listen, you gotta give President Obama a lot of credit. He has tried from day one to reach out on his health care to the other side. He has tried. We went through this long, arduous process with uh, Senator Baucus dealing with Senator Grassley. At the end of this long process, Senator Grassley walked away. So sure, I think President Obama's done it just right. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, though, if they don't want to come on and they want to make a political statement to make it look like they want uh, President Obama to fail in a signature issue for political reasons, then fine. We got to go do what we have to do. I don't like the idea that we'd have to do this if we did it through the reconciliation process, the 60 votes, because under the rules of the Senate on reconciliation, it can't impact the budget one way or the other, which really limits what you can actually get done on health care. So I would rather have a bipartisan, get Olympia Snow, or whoever it may be, and some, you know, you saw Bill Frisk came out today, uh, Tommy Thompson, uh, former HHS secretary under President Bush came out today for it. There's a coalition of folks building uh, that understand this is our time to do it. It doesn't work the way we have it today. You pay more for premiums. They continually cut your benefits. It's just not working. We can fix it if we all get together. And I want an efficiency. I don't mind paying. If, you know, if I is in that top 1%, if I got to pay some more time, fine. As long as it's efficiently done, what you want to make sure is that the, that the money is spent efficiently. Quality care affordable for everybody, include everybody. These are not, you know, other countries do that. We're the greatest nation in the world. We ought to be able to do it also. Let me also recognize the forum director. Uh, when I was chairman of the convention in Los Angeles, I've had a few jobs trying to remember that, which was a little thorny topic for me because if you read my book, President Clinton had announced that I was going to be the ambassador to Great Britain. There's only one other Irishman who's ever been that. That would be... Joe Kennedy, very good, very good. Um, Al Gore called me, I think, to thank me. I chaired a $26.3 million fundraiser one night at the MCI Arena one night, Blue Jeans Bash, to thank me. He said, Terry, you need to move to LA. Needs help, it's in trouble. Uh, so instead of going to Great Britain with my wife, five kids, two dogs, I went to LA. Uh, Noelle Rodriguez back here uh, headed up the LA host committee, and she and I worked very closely together. She then went on to become press secretary for Laura Bush. We're still very good friends, so she is in charge of all the forums. Give her a great round of applause if you could. 
Let me, let me just say in conclusion, I always like to you know, bring it all together here. Uh, first of all, for the young folks here, get active in politics. I always try to tell you, have fun in it. Now, as I say, I come from an entrepreneurial background. Uh, I've never worked for anyone in my life. I've always done my own thing. I think that's important. I would just tell you young folks in the audience, you should go out and do whatever you do that's going to make you happy and have fun. Uh, don't get stuck. I have never made a plan too far in the future because if I said I want to be here, then I haven't taken advantage of all these opportunities. I wouldn't have gone to work for Jimmy Carter in 1980. So leave yourself open. Do what you want to do. Take tremendous risks while you're young, when you don't have family, and do it. Have a good time doing it. And you are all blessed. You're all here at Harvard. I didn't even apply to Harvard. And <laughs> I didn't want to waste the postage stamp. Um, <laughs> but go out and do and be successful, whatever it is, and give back. That's what I do. And I happen to do it through politics. I do a lot of charity stuff, but I give it back through politics. It's the greatest country in the world. Don't let anyone ever tell you you can't do something that, uh, oh, you're too young. I've, I've heard it all my life. I was the youngest bank chairman in our nation's history at the age of 30. I've said, you can't do that. Forget it. Let them tell you that. Go out. Do what you want to do. Have fun. Take gigantic risks. But at the end of the day, folks, just remember this. There are millions of people who are getting out of bed every single day who are counting on you to fight for them because they have no ability. And I've seen it, and a lot of you have seen it campaigning. They can't put food on the table. Their kids aren't getting a quality education. It's incumbent upon us, and that's what elections for me are all about. It's fighting for those people out there who are counting on you to fight for them. And you know what? It's a better world when we all do that. So thank you, and I thank Bill Purcell and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Great. In the last 43 years, this Institute of Politics has had 530 fellows. We have six outstanding resident fellows here at this time. We have two additional visiting fellows who will come in during the course of the next two months. But please join me again in thanking what is the most exuberant fellow in the last half a century, Terry McCauley. <laughs> Thank you, Great.